Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring uh, by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. We couldn't be more excited to be hosting events during Secret Path Week in partnership with the Gore Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund. So the Downey Wenjack Fund is part of musician Gore Downey's legacy and embodies his commitment and that of both the Downey and Wenjack families to call Canadians to action in solidarity with Indigenous peoples of this land. So the goal is to continue the conversation that Chani Wenjack's residential school story started and to support the reconciliation process through awareness, education, and action. So in that spirit, all week long, we'll be joining in with classrooms across Canada uh, to help us celebrate with Indigenous scientists, artists, and leaders from across the country and to work towards meaningful reconciliation. So kicking us off today, we have Mike Downey. Mike is the co-founder of the Gore Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund. So after telling the tragic story of Chani Wenjack, an Ojibwe boy who died while running away from his residential school to his brother Gord, the two vowed to find a way to share this story with the world. This resulted in the multimedia project Secret Path and has captured the hearts and minds of Canadians across the country. So Mike is a writer, director, and producer of, no of numerous award-winning documentaries, including Secret Path, Invasion of the Brain Snatchers, One Ocean, and The Hockey Nomad. So Mike, it's so great to have you uh, joining in live with us today. We've got a great group of classrooms uh, joining us from across Canada, even more tuning in live via YouTube. So we're excited to, uh, to be hanging out with you today. Oh, me too, Joe. All Thank right. You. Excellent. Well, Mike, um, I think you're the perfect person to start us off for this week and to tell us a little bit about the inspiration behind everything that's going to be happening over the next few days. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me and, and hello to uh, all the classrooms that are uh, tuned in and everyone else who's watching on YouTube. Um, this is a really important week for the Downey Wenjack Fund. We call it Secret Path Week and um, it's really uh, about getting, uh, you know, we have things going on all year, but this is a week where we really want people to come together and think about what they're doing uh, for reconciliation. And um, so we've got different events going on in schools. We've got uh, public events going on in theaters and music and, and walks for Wenjack, all sorts of things going on. But I think most importantly, I think the week is really a reminder um, for all Canadians uh, to think about their country and to think about the country that, that, uh, that we live in and to think about how fair it is, how equitable it is, and have we really created something that, that's, that's fair uh, to all Canadians. And when we think about, you know, Indigenous lives, um, when we think about people living on reserve, when we think about boiled water advisories and all these different issues, I think it's really important to think about, you know, is this our country being the best country it can be. My brother Gord um, always believed that there was something missing, even when he was, you know, the uh, the age of, of, of some of the students uh, that are a part of our, uh, our talk today. He always felt that there was a little something missing in this country. And it was only later in life that he realized that this missing piece was indigenous lives, indigenous culture, that it was something that just had never been uh, never came into the classroom and just wasn't a part of the average Canadian's consciousness. And so, you know, in the last couple of years of his life, he really wanted to change that. He, he really wanted to have, uh, as he said, a people that we've been trained to ignore. He really wanted to, to stop that. He really wanted to turn that around and have all Canadians thinking about, I think, what is a great gift, which is that there are people that have been living on this land for thousands and thousands of years, and they should certainly be a part of who we think we are as Canadians. All right. Uh, well, Mike, there's no doubt that the project has had such an impact since uh, the two of you founded it, and it's continuing to have such a huge impact and a legacy uh, to this day. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share a little bit about um, maybe the first time you uh, came across Chani's story and how it impacted you and led to to sharing it with Gord and, and everything that's happened since. Absolutely. Um, I can tell you, I remember the day very well. I was driving in my car in my neighborhood in Toronto and I was listening to the CBC radio and there was a short radio doc done by Jody Porter, a reporter out of Thunder Bay. And she was describing this 12 year old boy who had run away from his residential school. And I remember driving in my car thinking, 
this is six years ago, by the way, I remember thinking residential school, um, I don't really know what she's referring to. I mean, I can imagine what she's referring to, but I don't really know a story about a residential school. And she said Indian residential school. So I, I'm kind of figuring it out, but I really don't know anything about it, which was, anyway, what really hit me over the head was in her, in her story was when she mentioned that, that this boy, Charlie or Channy Wenjack was, had run away and was trying to walk home and that his home was 600 kilometers away. And that just hit me over the head. Uh, and I just could imagine this 12 year old trying to get home, uh, walking along the tracks uh, in late October and um, of course not making it. And I went home, there was quite a bit of information about his story. Um, there was an online companion piece to this radio doc. And then of course I started reading, finding all these stories, uh, all this information about these residential schools. And I got to tell you, I sat in my home looking at these different, um, looking at this information, and I was really blown away. I couldn't get over the fact that this was such a massive program, 150,000 children involved over 150 years, and that I didn't know anything about it. I mean, uh, so the next day, Gordon and I were having lunch, and I had printed up this article that was a part of the information. And that was a McLean's article of a Canadian magazine from 1967. It was actually published on my brother's birthday, February 6th, 1967. And it was called The Lonely Death of Charlie Wenjack. And I pushed that article across the table to my brother. And I said, you got to read this. You're not going to believe it. And it was over this, this lunch when we kind of figured out that, you know, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've been all over this country filming stories. Um, Gord's been touring this country at that point, probably for 25 years, all over this country. And between the two of us, we didn't know a story about, uh, you know, a boy, a girl at a residential school. We didn't really have a clear understanding of what it was. We thought, you know, not that we're expert on anything particular, but kind of think that we know our own country. And over that lunch, we figured, you know, there's got to be a lot of other Canadians who don't know a story like this. And we, we vowed uh, at that lunch to try to find a way to tell the story. Um, and that's where it all started, Joe. All right. Um, so, I mean, it is a powerful story. And, and to think of, of, of Chani so determined to get home, to walk, to walk that distance, um, you know, to try and get back to his family. It is, I can see, I mean, it's such a, a story. So can you tell us a little a bit about the process of, of making the documentary, of making uh, the initial project come together? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I will say that I think, um, you know, this story, all the stories um, that we've come across, uh, they're almost all tragic. And, and and so devastating for the individual who, uh, the, the child who was at the residential school, but also for the family and for the extended community that they were from. The, these, um, the kids that survived it, their lives in many ways were, um, um, were shattered in many cases from this experience. There was something about Chani's story though, that it, there was something about it that was really universal uh, to us. And that was, you said it, trying to get home. I think you don't need to be someone who knows a lot about uh, indigenous, uh, you know, lives or what their living uh, conditions were like to understand home, the need to get home to where you're loved, to where people really care about you. So I think there was a universality to that. There was also, I think, something very powerful about just this sort of straight line literally walking along the tracks, trying to get home. So I think from the very beginning, um, we had this sense that this was a very, I mean, I say a very simple story, meaning he was trying to get home, trying to get away from something bad, back towards something, you know, loving, something that we all can relate to, uh, home. Um, so there was something about that universality and that simplicity uh, of what he was trying to accomplish that I think had uh, created, I think, a, a, a really uh, a good place to start. What happened was, 
we decided that we were going to try to, to uh, create a film about this. In the beginning, what we thought would be the best way would be to create a, uh, a film, but like a live action film that would come from a script uh, that would take this story and then you know build on that. So we sent this research package that we put together. We sent that out to a couple of different writers and then we waited to get you know, a response and to see if somebody wanted to join in on this project. What happened in the meantime was Gord had this research package as well and he started to go through it. And Gord being Gord, uh, someone who was always wanted to get moving, was just a very, very driven individual. Um, tried to write, you know, he didn't write a song a day, but he probably came pretty close. But he started to take this research and write these poems. And what he did was he ended up writing 10 poems that told the story from the very beginning, from the school, all the way to Chaney running away and, and ultimately, um, well, his death along the tracks a few days later. So he created these poems, but it was really just, you know, it, it, it kind of, there's a, there's a lesson here. Um, which is he created something that because he had to, it was, it was a, something inside of him. And instead of just waiting for the next, uh, you know, to take the next step, he decided he would do something just for himself, just for himself to write it down, to process the information and turn it into for him art, a poem. So he wrote 10 poems and, but we were continuing to try to figure out if we can find somebody to adapt this story into like a, a, a short novel, a novella or something like that. In the meantime, Gord got a call from a, a friend of his, uh, Kevin Drew from Broken Social Scene. And Kevin told my brother, you know, Gord, I've always really you know, loved your work and always thought we could make a great record together. Gord was very flattered by this and said, well, I would love to someday. And Kevin said, oh, have you, do you have anything you've, anything you've been working on, any songs? And Gord said, no, I don't. And then he thought, wait a minute, I've got these 10 poems. So I reached out to Pearl Wenjack um, and told her that uh, my brother Gord and I had come across the story of her brother and that we wanted to somehow try to bring the story to the mainstream, somehow try to tell the story. We asked if that would be something that, that, that the family would, would be okay with or would want to happen at all. And she said, yes. So Gord went into the studio and they recorded the 10 poems. The 10 poems became 10 songs. And that was something that Gord called Secret Path. And then we kind of went in a different direction. We went to a graphic novelist, a graphic artist named Jeff Lemire, who had done some incredible work. Um, is one of Canada, a real Canadian treasure. And we went to Jeff and said, here's this really powerful story. Here are these 10 songs. Is this something that you think you could work with? And he was, I'll tell you, we went uh, out for a coffee not far from uh, where his office was. And we told him the story of Chani Wenjek. And he was very moved by it. He'd already been involved in a few different initiatives to uh, take his, you know, he, he does these beautiful uh, comic books. He does these beautiful graphic novels. And he had done some work in a few uh, Northern communities with uh, indigenous students. So this topic was, was very close to his heart. But at, over the coffee, he said, you know, I, this is an amazing project. I really think this is going to, to happen, but I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm booked up. I've got these projects lined up over the next year. And I remember, you know, when we were saying goodbye at the end of this uh, little meeting, I was so disappointed and, and so was Gord because we really thought this is somebody who really could have, you know, moved this forward. And, um, but we understood, you know, he, he was a busy guy. The interesting thing is the next day, he sent this drawing of Chani Wenjack to Gord in an email and Gord forwarded it to me. And then the subject line, it said, you better sit down for this, Mike. And he had gone back to his office after telling us his studio, after telling us he, he couldn't really do this. And he said that he sat down at his drafting table where he draws and he didn't have an image of what Chani looked like at all. We didn't think a picture existed at that point of, of Chani. And he said he just started to draw. He didn't think about it. He didn't consciously change his mind that, oh, I, I'd like to you know, be involved with this. He just started to draw. He said it felt like his hand was being moved across the page. 
Um, and what he created was this image of Chani Wenjek sitting in the swing, looking straight, you know, looking straight at you. And it's a very, very powerful image. And it was, I think, a real, um, it was a moment for Jeff. He realized, no, actually, I want to be involved with this. I want to see what I can do to help bring this forward. Um, and then, of course, he created the graphic novel, 10 chapters based on the 10 songs, which are based on the 10 poems. And then we put it all together uh, into an animated film. And that film opens with a documentary piece of Gord, my brother Patrick, myself going up to a Goki post to meet Pearl and her surviving sisters, um, to show them the work that, that, that had happened and to ask for their blessing to move forward with this project. So that's the, um, that's the documentary piece. And in the middle, of course, is this animated film that, that shows this 12 year old boy running away from his school um, and trying to get home. And it's, um, you know, it's something that, that I think has been, um, well, between the album, the book and the film, I know it's been introduced into hundreds and thousands of classrooms and students have, have been inspired by it and teachers and they've created art, they've created plays, they've created all sorts of things. And of course they've moved on and looked deeper into the subject. I mean, I like to think that Secret Path is kind of an on-ramp, you know, an on-ramp on a highway that, that gets you sort of into that, going in that direction. Um, there's so much more to learn about residential schools and about reconciliation and really about obviously indigenous culture, teachings and traditions. But there's something about this 12 year old boy that really seems to, to grab people and make them, make them pay attention. Um, and you know, it's, it's been a life changer. The Downey Wenjack Fund, it was created, the Gore Downey and Chani Wenjack Fund was created of Secret Path. When this all was launched in 2016, we wanted to make sure that this didn't just sort of become a media project that comes and sort of gets people stirred up and then moves on, you know, because that's really the nature of, of how these things work. I, I've been in film business for over 20 years and um, you can have great impact. It's hard to have sustained impact. So we decided we'd create this fund to try to capture some of that energy and remember, when that happened in 2016, Gord was already uh, had made public his terminal diagnosis of his brain cancer. Um, so there was a lot of attention um, that was placed on Gord. The Tragically Hip did a did a huge farewell tour in the summer of 2016, and so there was a lot of well, there was just a lot of uh, there was a lot of interest and a lot of love, quite frankly, that was being directed at Gord, and we wanted to try to harness that and not just let it sort of leak out into the ether, but to put it to some positive use. And, you know, when Gord was on, on the stage in Kingston, at his very last show with his band, he told the country with 15 million people watching, the prime minister himself sitting uh, in the upper deck uh, at the K-Rock Center, you know, said, look, we have to do something about this. This is a people that we've been trained to ignore, but we all know that there's something really, really wrong here. It's really, really bad, but we're going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it. And so that was a pretty good uh, send up uh, for Secret Path, which was then released about a month and a half later or two months later um, on the 50th anniversary of Chani's death. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's one of those, uh, in some ways, you know, sitting here on the second anniversary of my brother's death today, um, you know, it's, it's hard to believe it all happened, um, but it feels like there was a purpose. It was a purpose to my brother's life. He made a lot of Canadians feel very proud to be Canadian. And then in his last few, um, the last few years of his life, he wanted to inspire Canadians to create a better country. So anyway, I'm getting choked up. It's very, um, very proud of my brother. Sorry, Joe. No, um, Mike, absolutely no need to apologize. The, thank you so much for sharing the stories, you know, behind the formation of, 
of Secret Path and, and the media has such an impact. I remember the first time I heard the album. I remember the first time I saw the video and we're going to connect to some classrooms right now who, you know, it, it's that legacy um, is, is impacting them right now. And they're going to have some questions, probably share some stories. So I'm really excited uh, to have all of these great classrooms joining us today um, who, can, who can, can share some of that with, with us today, share some of that with you today, mm -hmm. some of that impact. Sounds wonderful. All right. Well, we have tons of classrooms joining us on YouTube. I'm going to try uh, and give a quick shout out to some of them. Um, so let's see. We've got grade eights hanging out in Woodstock, Ontario with us. We've got some grade sixes in Westminster, Brockville. We've got uh, some kids hanging out in Cambridge, Ontario with Mrs. Gill. Another classroom at Ottawa Technical Secondary School hanging out with us. Grade sixes in Newfoundland. Um, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Amherst View, some grade six, sevens hanging out with us. Um, Oshawa, Ontario, grade sevens in Chatham, Ontario. So there's tons and tons. French Immersion hanging out with us in Port Algon. Lots of students hanging out with us via YouTube. Don't forget to use the chat sidebar. Send us in some questions. We'll definitely work some of those in. But let's get to some of our live classrooms. Let's meet uh, some of our students. So we're going to start off, we're going to go to Brampton, Ontario. We've got some grade eights hanging out with Mrs. Nemco. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, grade eights? Good. All right, who's up with a question? Pardon? Is that a question? Yeah, we have a question. Josh. <laughs> Which one of your documentaries was the most inspiring? Um, I would, uh, it probably has to be Secret Path. Um, I've had the chance to make uh, several different kinds of films, uh, several environmental films. Um, I've made a couple of hockey films uh, and they all meant a lot to me, but there was something about um, the Secret Path and we, we actually had the chance to, uh, in 2016, we uh, released Secret Path, and then a year later, we released what's called Gore Downey's Secret Path in Concert, and that is the the live concert that Gord and his band did uh, in Roy Thompson Hall um, when we launched Secret Path uh, in 2016, and then the following year, so that was 2017, the following year, um, in 2018, also on CBC, we launched uh, Finding the Secret Path, which kind of tells the whole backstory and the story of, of how this all came to be and how Gord's life and Chani's life really kind of met and crossed over. Um, so I would say The Secret Path has been a life changer. I'm so proud of it. I'm so proud of all the people that were involved in it, of the Wenjack family who allowed uh, us to, to try and tell that story. And, um, uh, but I would say, yeah, the three films uh, I'm, I'm inspired me all and I'm, I'm very, very proud of. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Nemco's class for starting us off with a question. Let's jump now. Let's go to Waterloo. We have a ton of students hanging out with Mrs. Giannopoulos. Looks like some grade seven, eight students. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing grade seven, eight? All right. I like that flag. I love it. All right, who's up with a question? How did you collect all of the stories along the way on the secret path? Like all the all the stories that he had along the way, like his mask from Halloween and all those stories. How did you collect them? Sorry, sorry, Joe. What what's the question? Um. Maybe she can pop back up again, but I think she's wondering how how are the stories collected for for Secret Path? The stories, well, I w well, for the the stories that go with the different uh, the different songs, really, um, they came out of out of the research. And and again, you know, Gord as a songwriter um, also just used I think his own creativity to create, um, and and Jeff Lemire. Um, sort of use their own creativity to, I guess, maybe try to imagine a little bit what was going through 
a 12 year old, uh, a 12 year old boy's mind as he was going along the tracks and night was falling and it was getting colder and the weather was, you know, turning and, the, and there was, you know, perhaps snow in the forecast. So I think it was, you know, our, a couple of uh, artists taking what, you know, there was, there is quite a bit of information uh, that we know about, about Chani, um, but clearly taking some artistic license to then say, what might it have been like? And if you notice in the songs, um, Gord uh, sings in first person and the lyrics are very stripped down. They are, uh, you know, Gord liked to get very, uh, he created, uh, you know, he would pack in a lot of lyrics into his tragically hip songs and some of his solo work. In this one, he kept them very spare. But I think trying to think about what would a 12 year old boy, how would he be processing, you know, his environment? How would he be? feeling and so he left them quite spare and if you listen to the music I think you'll notice that there is a lot of atmospheric sound in there so in other words there's kind of room uh, in the songs to create you know these sort of soundscapes um, that I think really elevate really elevate the music but I would say it's you know you're looking at something that is um, you know based on on a real person and and a real uh, you know, flight or, or, you know, from his, you know, when he ran away. And, and then you've got a couple of really talented artists uh, working, you know, with the Wenjack family to sort of try to capture a little bit of, you know, uh, what it was like. And I will say this, when we went up to Ogoki Post, uh, it's also called Martin Falls, um, this remote flying community where, where Chani grew up and where his sister Pearl and um, Evelyn still live. Um, you know, we showed them the, the graphic novel and, and Pearl said, you know, this is this is really what the residential school was like, you know, the scene where they're shaving, cutting off his hair um, and, you know, lying in, in the dormitory. Um, she said it, this really is what it felt like. Uh, so I, I think that was really important that that she felt that it was, uh, you know, uh, it was. Um, I don't know if it's accuracy or, or if it's just that that there was the, the right the right mood the right you know the right feeling of what it was like and because Pearl and and her sisters uh, Daisy Evelyn they all went off they all were sent to residential schools as well and you know even with siblings at the same residential school they would often keep them apart if you can imagine you know so maybe a little bit of comfort that you could get from your older sister and Pearl is uh, six years older than Chani. And, you know, you can imagine, you know, if he was, um, well, you know, she did, she wasn't there the year that he ran away. She was 18 by then. So she was out of the, out of the system, but you can imagine that kind of, uh, you know, comfort that an older sibling could provide. Well, they weren't allowed to, they, they were kept, they were kept separated. So, um, anyway, that's a great question. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much to our class in Waterloo, Ontario. We're going to visit Mrs. King now. They're hanging out with us in Canada and looks like some grade eight students. Let me see if I can get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Canada? Good. Wow. Where were you involved in the making of the secret path? Sorry, where, what was I involved? Oh, where were yeah. you involved in the making of the secret path? Okay, uh, so I'm basically, uh, you know, brought this story to Gord, and then I'm the co-creator of of Secret Path. So Jeff Lemire was the artist, Gord was the songwriter, uh, Kevin Drew and uh, helped, you know, uh, record the songs and produce the songs, uh, and I helped all the way along, uh, and but mostly in the film. So um, in the film, we hired Justin Stevenson to do with the animation. Um, and so I would have been a producer on the film. And, you know, there's the documentary at the beginning and at the end, I directed the documentary parts on our trip up to uh, Ogoki Post. So, you know, I mean, this is a, um, it really is a, it's a Gord Downey project. Uh, and I was, you know, Gordon and I had the chance over the years to work together several times. I got the chance to direct a few of his videos over the years. This, uh, working with Gordon on this, really kind of uh, 
you know, supporting him um, and getting a chance to work with Jeff Lemire and Justin Stevenson and everyone else who was involved, my brother Patrick. Um, it was a real team effort. And, um, you know, you're lucky if, if you get a chance to do something that you think really matters, you know, a few times in your life. And this is definitely one of those uh, projects that I feel really mattered. And I feel honored to have had the chance to play whatever role, however small, I, I'm honored to, uh, to have my name on, on this project. So Michael, along those lines, I'm just looking at the questions coming in from the YouTube uh, community. And so our group in Oshawa, Oshawa, Vincent Massey, just wanted to share that, um, you know, as soon as Secret Path came out, they shared it with their students. They feel the loss of Gordon and continue to reflect on its impact. And so they just wanted to say that uh, for all this, you, know, you should be really proud. And then uh, they're, they're wondering about more media. Will there be more media, more stories coming out around Secret Path? Um, that's a great question. I, I think that, um, I, I guess the answer is yes. I guess the answer is yes. Um, I don't think you're gonna see another film but we are, you know, we have on Saturday night here in Toronto, Secret Path Live. So we're restaging that original concert all over again. We've got the original band, which are friends of Gord's, Josh Finlayson, Kevin Drew, who I mentioned, mentioned Kevin Hearn from Bare Naked Ladies, uh, Dave Hamlin and uh, Charles Spearin. And they've come together and they are going to, uh, we're restaging the concert again. And because we don't have Gord this time, um, we've got some of his friends, we've got indigenous and non-indigenous uh, performers, singers coming in to help do the 10 different songs. So we have Sam Roberts, we have July Talk, we have Buffy St. Marie, we have Tanya Tagak, we have William Prince, and um, uh, Sarah Harmer just uh, joined the, the concert a few days ago, we just announced that. So we will be filming all of that because it's gonna be a really powerful evening. Um, and uh, that'll be another piece that we'll be putting out probably more in like short pieces, like, you know, maybe um, you'll see us uh, on social media, you'll see one of the songs released um, from that night. But uh, yeah, the work continues. And, you know, we're, you know, in, in some ways, I guess, the art now is being created by Canadians across the country, but students like you, who are creating art, creating films, creating uh, live uh, theater, and I hope it keeps coming, you know, I, I really do. I think that, you know, there is, to me, your generation is the one that's gonna get this right. Uh, I think that when we think about our country, when, we, when I, I grew up, um, Canadian history did not include indigenous people in any way. I mean, it was so cursory, it was so tiny and what we were really getting was the colonial history of Canada. And I think that's all, I know it's all changing. I've met many, many teachers across the country and, and I can feel their enthusiasm to get the true history of Canada told. And, you know, I think that in the coming years, um, you know, I, I'm sort of, I'm really optimistic and, and really looking forward to, you know, the kind of conversations that I know you're going to be having, whether it's, you know, at school or at home around the kitchen table with your parents, because you gotta, <laughs> you gotta help us older people, you know, understand these issues better. Um, but I do, I do think that the stories that are coming forward will be from indigenous artists, you know, indigenous writers. Th there is quite a great wealth of it already. I think it's just time for it to come right into, you know, the mainstream of Canada. So the stories that I think you're going to be hearing next will be, um, they will be about residential schools. They're already out there now. And I, I, bet, you've, I bet you've already read some of them or, or seen a couple of the films that are out there that are fantastic. Um, and, you know, I think, I hope that Secret Path, if it does anything, it opens the way for more Canadians to want to know more of these stories. Some of them are very painful, uh, but others, uh, you know, are equally as important um, because it really, it really shows us, I think, in many ways, what is the resiliency and, and I think the importance of Indigenous culture. You know, if we lived in Europe, um, we wouldn't have this ability to try to figure out what this place was like thousands of years ago. We have that opportunity with Indigenous stories um, and understanding the culture, traditions and teachings of the Indigenous. So, 
to answer your question, um, I think there's a lot of work coming. It's coming from, from students like you, and it's also coming from indigenous writers, artists, filmmakers, and I'm, I'm really, well, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Let's jump to Mrs. Cook's group. They're in Brampton, Ontario, grade four or five hanging out. I think they're in the library. Let's turn their mics on. How are we doing grade four or fives? Goodbye. Awesome. All right, who's up with a question? Hi. Hello. My name is Sandy and I have a question. How do people even find out about what happened to Jamie? How did I find out about it? So how did people, anybody find out about what happened? Oh, very, oh, I, I get it. Very good question. Um, I will tell you that um, when his, when Chani was found, they, it launched a, a medical inquiry in 1966. So, and, and at that time, they actually discovered a lot about what was going on in residential schools. And there were recommendations from this medical inquiry. So there's quite a bit of information. They, they sent up, um, I don't know who would have uh, run the investigation, but they were very, they had an uh, inquiry. Uh, a lot of this information came. They had people from the school. Um, and the other piece where a lot of this information came from is Ian Adams. And he was a writer from McLean's Magazine in 1966. And he traveled up there. He heard the story, Ian did. And he traveled up there and attended the medical inquiry. And he wrote that article that I mentioned earlier that was in the magazine that was published on my brother's birthday, February 6th, 1967, called The Lonely Death of Charlie Wenjack. And there is so much information in there about what happened and a little bit about what was happening at the residential schools. Unfortunately, with even with that much information, now remember at that time, McLean's was, it was the national magazine of Canada. It was read by, I would say hundreds of thousands of Canadians every week. Um, but even with that, that much coverage, um, that was 1967. Residential schools were around for a lot, you know, many, many more years. Um, so it doesn't feel like the recommendations from the inquiry were really ever acted upon, uh, but there was certainly a lot of information. And, and I think it's really important because remember, they, they believe there's over 5,000 of these students that never made it home, that died in these schools. And for many of them, there is no information at all. They don't know where they were buried. They were, I don't know if they were covered up but there's very, very little information. So this makes this story, there's also, a, there's a couple of other stories that are quite prominent about children who died at residential schools. But this one in particular, it's a very good question because that is how, that is where a lot of the information came from. If there hadn't been that medical inquiry, um, if the police hadn't been involved, if Ian Adams, a very good reporter, hadn't been involved, then a lot of this information would have been lost. So I think we're lucky that those people did their job and recorded it, even though it didn't really have a, a whole lot of impact for a long time, it was important because when we went to look back, um, there it was, there was all this information. So thank you for your question. All right, awesome question. And that's what's so important about recording history is, you know, in the time it might not have an impact, but having that history can, can have an impact in the future. Absolutely. Uh, Mrs. Burns class, they're hanging out in Thornhill, Ontario. Looks like some grade six, seven, and eights in that group. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Thornhill? Hey. Awesome. Um, we've been trying to think of ideas about how we can do something. What do you think students should be doing? Oh, uh, great question. Great question. So, I mean, I think that, you know, when we, when we hear about something that is, you know, we're, we think is a, a terrible um, situation that needs, to be, that needs to be fixed, needs to be rectified, I think it's good to think about three stages, three stages. Um, because what we really want to do often is get right into, you know, making the changes and, and fixing things. But it's important to kind of go along a, a development path, if you will. 
the first step is awareness. I, I think it's safe to say, you know, just looking out at, at all these classrooms today, we are through the awareness stage. The second stage is the education stage. And the education stage is I know what's happening in your classrooms these days. It's finding out more about what this program, this government program was all about and how it impacted generation after generation of indigenous people. Like it's, it's hard to believe, but um, so that, that is, I think we're really well into that phase, uh, the education part. Now comes a third part, which I think is what you're asking about is the action part. Now we get into the interesting part because we're going to try to you know, change the way things are. I really believe that the action part comes from individuals trying to figure out what they can do moving forward in the name of reconciliation. So it, it might be a something, something as simple as you know, making sure that Orange Shirt Day is, is you know, um, recognized at your school, probably already is. Um, but it, it may also be you know, asking your teachers you know, um, questions in the classroom that have to do with, oh, what, what, would, be, what would be the indigenous perspective on something like this? Um, what would be, you know, this other piece of it? Um, wouldn't it be great if, you know, at our next assembly, not only do we do a land acknowledgement, but we find, you know, the, the nearest um, uh, indigenous uh, band, First Nation band, whatever that is, uh, Inuit in, in those cases, or Métis, and wouldn't it be wonderful, wonderful if we could invite an elder to our, you know, school assembly to say a few words? Um, so I, I do think, and so what, what does that cover? Well, that covers maybe some awareness, definitely some education, but also some action. And maybe we find out, you know, as a school, maybe we've, you know, you find out more about what is, is there a, you know, a reserve close close by that you could learn more about. Um, so I do think, you know, um, it, it is such a reconciliation is such a large topic. We're not going to come up with the, the fix, so to speak, the government program. The government has a big responsibility, I think, to continue to make sure that education funding levels are the same on reserve as they are, you know, in, in classrooms across the country. Um, I do think, you know, we, we still have issues like clean water. Um, we have issues of inequality, you know, across the country. We need to make sure that our, you know, here, here we are in the middle of a federal election. You know, we need to make sure that our, our um, uh, politicians understand that we care about these issues. We care about many issues, but this is one of them. Um, I do think as a country, we have an opportunity to create something really, really wonderful here. I think we've got a great country uh, already. It, it can be a lot better. And, uh, and I, think it's, I think we're gonna find our place in the world when we figure out how indigenous culture and teachings and traditions become more of an idea or more of a part of who we think we are as a country. I, we haven't done that before. If this happens, your generation will be the first um, to basically, you know, understand that Canada is not a 150 year old country. It, you know, it can't be. It, we have citizens that have been here for thousands of years. So I really believe that it's, it's you know, what's coming is um, small actions, but progressive actions, you know, whether it is, you know, figuring out a way to um, connect, you know, uh, reading, in, in, reading Indigenous uh, novels uh it, like it, it kind of is just a greater awareness i think is a, is a huge part of it um but yeah to answer your question i think you name it conversations asking questions uh trying to figure out you know is should there be an indigenous piece you know to this um and in many cases the answer is yes there should be so then then we have to go out and figure out the best way to do that the other thing is you know, I think importantly, that's why I mentioned the awareness and education. It also applies to this culture. Um, you know, you have to be respectful. You have to learn as much as you can about this culture. And when you do, I think you're gonna be, maybe you already have, it's so fascinating. You look at things like gratitude. Gratitude is one of the most, this is what I've learned. It's one of the most important parts of relationships with between indigenous and the way indigenous you know, interact with, with, you know, the rest of us, non-Indigenous. Gratitude, 
really basic things, but they're so powerful. And they're, they're in many ways, they're kind of ancient ideas. We look at things like the medicine wheel and all of the things that go into that, that really make so much sense in our daily living. And of course, you know, we all, you know, we live in a very high speed, you know, uh, techno you know technology driven society. In many cases, you know, indigenous teaching is about breaking through that because it really is about the importance of, as I said, gratitude, um, really important to slow down, to think about the bigger themes um, in our lives. Um, and they're all right there in front of us, but sometimes it's easy to ignore. So I hope I've answered your question, but uh, I, I really think there's, there's room for everyone to be involved. And I'm really excited about, you know, what's happening in the classrooms and how we're all becoming, I think, more aware and better educated on indigenous lives and indigenous culture. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. Small individual actions taken together on a whole across the country can have such a massive impact and can make a movement. So it yeah. is really about the awareness and then doing something no matter how small. Um, yeah, I agree. Forward. All right, uh, where do we have to go next? Let's go to Haleybury, Ontario. Uh, grade eight's hanging out with Mrs. Taylor. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Haley Berry? Or Burry? Burry. Yeah, we can hear you. You're on. Okay. Um, what do you hope to accomplish moving forward with the Winjack Fund? Fun. Great question. Um, what, what we hope to accomplish is, I mean, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things is happening right now uh, is getting more and more schools involved with, um, we have something called the Downey Wenjek Fund Legacy School Program. Um, and it's basically a network of, of students and educators that are, you know, kind of collaborating on how to bring what I was just sort of describing, indigenous culture, teachings and traditions along with the history of residential schools um, and in, into the classroom. So the way that the legacy schools works is basically it, it becomes a network. We have uh, a group of advisors, uh, educators, uh, whose schools are legacy schools right across this country. And you know we are trying to amplify the work that's being done by the schools that have been you know, very progressive, uh, who have elders coming into their schools, who have uh, in some cases, they do smudges. They have smudging stations uh, at the school when students arrive in the morning, which, you know, if you've ever had the chance to do a smudge and someone has, an indigenous person has explained it to you, it's really something because it's all about clarifying. It's all about, you know, uh, you know clearing the mind and, and, the, and the heart, uh, the eyes, everything so that you can, you know, see things as they are without, you know, being clouded by the things that we carry around with us, judgments and things like that. So what we're trying to do with schools that have been very progressive is amplify what they're doing uh, and allow them to, you know, communicate and, and uh, inspire uh, other classrooms, other schools uh, that may be earlier in the process and haven't had, you know, those opportunities yet. So we want to inspire uh, classrooms that are doing great work so they keep doing it and amplify it so that other classrooms pick up where they, what they've done. And then at the other end, schools that are getting started, we want, it, we want them to you know, feel like they're not alone. People sometimes worry about doing the wrong thing, and that's not a bad instinct. Um, but we do have support for you um, so that you can feel confident going forward that you won't do the wrong thing or, or you know, offend um, you know, indigenous people, um, cause that's really important. It's really important to move forward in the right way. Um, at the same time, you don't want to let that paralysis, um, sneak in. So, and then the other thing we're doing is, so that's the classroom. That's your generation. We're also in large institutions, companies, universities, and we're creating legacy spaces that are basically a place um, it becomes a fiscal space. There's a poster of Chaney and Gord. There's a plate. There's a smudge ball. There's several pieces that come together. And it basically says in this, in this area, this institution recognizes the importance of reconciliation. And this is a place for those conversations to happen. And, and it sort of shows the commitment. Uh, so whether it's for their indigenous employees, 
uh, for their you know, indigenous suppliers who, who may, they may be uh, doing business with, whatever that is, create this greater warn awareness that, that there is more to be done and that you can you know, help, um, I, I think, make a country that, that really has more uh, opportunities for indigenous um, and, and I, I think creates ultimately a better country. So those are just, those are a couple of things that the Downey Wenjack Fund is, is trying to do. We're really trying to inspire people to move forward, to, to, to find their own way to get involved with reconciliation. You know, I, I mentioned Secret Path Live on Saturday night. That's a way for musicians to get involved uh, in reconciliation, to do something. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think this movement is best served by people, you know, sort of st sticking within their lane. You know, if they're an employer, they could ask, um, how many Indigenous employees do we have? Is it zero? Do we know? And if we do, if we don't have any, what can we do about that? Uh, and if we do have some, what are we doing to recognize them and to support them? So, like I said, it kind of goes right across the gamut. But we really want to inspire Canadians, um, you know, through somebody that they really, many uh, of maybe you or your parents, somebody they really trusted, my brother Gord. You know, he sang about this country for 30 years. He had a real instinct about what this country was good at and what we weren't good at. And um, so we're hoping that that trust... Uh, and the trust that, that I believe uh, he developed uh, and the fund has developed with Indigenous people, we create enough trust that we can sort of move forward together um, and make real change. All right, so we have one more class to visit, Mike. We're going to go to Burlington with some grade sixes with Mrs. Patterson. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Burlington? Hi! Hello. Hello. Um, hi, Mike uh, and Joe and everybody else. Uh, we have a grade six class here as well as a grade seven class. Uh, and we have a question from Mason. Um, I have a question. Do they have any rights to stay So the question, I don't know if you heard it, is did they have any rights to stay at their home? Uh, great question. And the answer is no. No. If you were on the list, to go to a residential school, you went. And if you didn't go, they, in, in many cases, they would send either the, what was called the Indian agent uh, onto the reserve to find uh, the student. Uh, if the parents refused, uh, in many cases, one of the parents was put in jail. And uh, there are stories of, of families that they, they took their children and they went out on the land and they literally um, in many cases, they, they may have they may have saved, um, you know, saved their child's life. Um, but there wasn't this was not um, it was compulsory. It, it, there was no option. You, you couldn't, you know, as a parent, as the student, you couldn't say, I'd really rather not. I'd rather stay here. And um, it, which is really it's, it's mind blowing, really, that, that you could have a program that would be so focused on, on a child, but really not focused on the well-being of the child or the family. But they had, they had no option at all. And, you know, the thing to think about, one of the things to think about is this didn't just happen, you know, across a generation. This happened for generation after generation after generation. And there are, there are people who, uh, uh, individuals, Canadians who went to residential school, their parents went to a residential school and their grandparents went to a residential school. And you can imagine what kind of, you know, how destructive that would have been to a family unit to have children uh, taken out of the, the home, um, in many cases for 10 months of the year, in, in, in some cases, you know, 12 months of the year, there are stories of, of that as well. So no, there, there, were, there were no, there was no saying no thank you. Um, it was, uh, it, 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 you didn't have any choice whatsoever. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to our students. Thank you so much for spending some time with us uh, today for your great questions. It's so great to see such a large group uh, of students spending some time with us uh, today and thinking about um, these important issues at the, at the beginning of Super Path Week. Mike, I can't thank you enough for starting the series of events with us, for sharing the story with us. Um, you know, for sharing some things that students can do to do something that, as we work towards reconciliation, 
Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to host you today, and I'm excited for what the rest of the, the week has to has to bring. We have so many Indigenous leaders and scientists and artists who will be joining us for events with classrooms across Canada. It's going to be a ton of fun, and I think there's going to be a lot of learning and a lot of awareness uh, spread over the next week. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you very much for having me. I'm really honored to to be here and and to uh, to be a part of this conversation. And, and I just I just want to say uh, to all the students and all the teachers there, uh, keep up the good work. It, we're really we're you're really doing something special here. It, you know, I, I know there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different issues that we face today, and and many of them are, are really important, if not critical. This is one of them, and it really is about our country. And I feel so good knowing that there is this generation uh, that is that believes uh, that understands the injustice of, of much that that came before, and is really determined to change that and to really understand your country, understand your own country in in its fullest. And it's not all very pretty, as you as you know. Um, but we we never want to turn away from that. We we need to have the courage to face it. And to make it better and and i feel it and i can feel it moving so thank you all um and uh yeah uh, I, i'm i'm honored all right well the last thing we'll do today uh boys and girls i'm going to unmute all your microphones if you want to give a big thank you to mike uh for today then we can we can sign off so here we go microphones are coming on uh let's hear it classroom <laughs> All right. They're always so good at that part. Uh, thanks again, Ken, uh, Classrooms. And Mike, thank you so much. We have lots more events coming up this week. We're just getting started. Uh, please, I saw a lot of teachers taking pictures and video. Uh, share those on Twitter. Hashtag Secret Path Week. Um, tag uh, at Downey Wenjack, as well as at Mike C. Downey. We want to see pictures of classrooms in action today. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>